And、uh, I think to the points that we've been talking about in terms of emotional processing, I think that also speaks a little bit to the difference in the response to the pandemic by age, because. Research before the pandemic had shown that、uh, older adults, and, and there are different reasons behind this. Some, you know, changes in the development of the brain over time,、uh, a collection of experiences that people have had and, and processed. But older adults generally have demonstrated better ability to manage emotions with age. So over time, both within individuals. And then greater day-to-day emotional stability and the ability to、uh, tolerate uncertainty and kind of the unknowingness of of what's going on. Well, as a young adult, we start to call into question: Is this normal? Right? This kind of because we haven't lived independently and experienced anything other than this. Everyone, I'm Denise Gorin. Welcome to Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Thanks for joining us as we speak with experts, authors, parents, and even young adults to explore the transition from parenting our young children to building healthy relationships with our now adults. Hopefully, we'll grow together, learn about ourselves, our young adults, and of course, when to bite our tongues. We are so happy you're with us. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Before we get started, I want to let listeners know that we're going to take a short break for a few weeks to prepare for some exciting new episodes that will begin in September. While on break, we're not going to leave you high and dry. We're going to drop some of our favorite episodes from the last two seasons. I feel like it always helps to listen again, jog our memories, and think more deeply about some of the things we've talked about. Anyway, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that it's really easy to support our podcast. Just buy us a cup of coffee. That's right. Visit our website at biteyourtonguepodcast dot com. Look in the right hand corner for a big orange button that says "How to Support Us." When that page opens, click on "Buy Us a Coffee," and presto, you've supported our podcast. Thank you. For those that have already bought us coffee, we want to do a special call out. We want to thank Betsy P, Jennifer V, Max C, Emily B, Charles V, Anne C, and Marcia T. Thank you so much for your support. It means so much to us. Also, the deal still stands with our wonderful sponsor, Shapermint. Twenty percent off with the code at checkout. Bite your tongue. No spaces. All right, listeners, we're done with our business. Let's get started. I'm thrilled that Ellen's joining us today, having returned recently from her daughter's wedding. Ellen, welcome back. So we've done a few wedding episodes, and now you've been through it all. Tell us about it. Any advice? So it was fantastic. It was magical. It was wonderful, and I learned a lot from the podcast on how to be a better mother-in-law and how to keep everybody happy.、Uh, you asked if I had some advice, though, and I would say two things. I would. Put out there to anybody who's having a child getting married is to really try to enjoy the process, like try to savor every moment because it goes by very, very fast. And then a practical tip that no one brought up when we were on any of our wedding podcasts: assign somebody to take casual pictures.、Mm-hmm. That's the one thing we really miss. Like, you, yes, you've got the photographer, and they do candid's, but it's not quite the same as a friend, like. Tell a friend, not as part of the family, not part of the wedding party,、mm-hmm, to just、mm-hmm. snap away. And we did not do that, and we wish we had. Well, and you want those pictures before you get your professional ones back. Great idea. Okay, so it seems like. Well, why don't you talk about this? Why are we talking about COVID today? It seems like everyone thinks this is over, but. Oh, you want me to weigh in on this? Oh my gosh, my whole work life has changed over the last two years. I am the busiest I've ever been. I spend at least two or three hours triaging people who have kids who are struggling, and the parents are struggling too. Like anyone in my in in the field of mental health is working the hardest they've ever worked. What used to be like you know a three hour evaluation with a child is now a five hour evaluation because、wow. they just have it's just 
kids are very depressed. I think it's hit young adults very, very hard. Emerging adults, high school students, college students. So this is a, it is, we haven't even begun to peel this away. And not to mention the stress on the parents as well. To some extent, grandparents seeing their grandchildren go through this and trying to support everybody. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. First of all, I was shocked to hear about this. I happened upon this article in the New York Times by Jan Hoffman. The article, Young Adults Report Rising Levels of Anxiety and Depression in the Pandemic, quotes a key young researcher, Mark Seisler, who's probably not much older than some of our adult children. But he was in this group of scientists who helped do this study about the COVID outbreak. It's called COPE. Mark's on the line with us. So Mark, anything I say wrong here, help us. You were part of a group. Tell us how this came to be, this study. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, it actually started, so I was in, um, I'm from Boston originally. I had just graduated from college and wanted to kind of fly the coop and learn to live independently. And so I had, I was fortunate to get some funding to go to Australia you can say it was a Fulbright, a wait a minute, wait a minute. You can brag. It was a Fulbright scholarship to Australia, right? <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> Go is. Go for that it, is Mark. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and so I was very fortunate to be starting a, a project. And as someone who's interested in medicine, I was in a hospital setting. And then all of a sudden, March of 2020 came around. And I was just, I had been there for six weeks, uh, just signed a lease and all that. And then the project got canceled. The Fulbright was suspended nationally. And all of a sudden, I was on my way. I had, you know, 72 hours to pack up everything and then haul back to the United States. Uh, during that time, kind of partly in an effort to remain engaged with, I was in a graduate program at Monash University in Melbourne, and I wanted to kind of see that through. You know, we thought it would be a one or two month project to kind of look at sleep and mental health in the population during this very quick outbreak. And so we, we launched what would eventually become the COPE initiative, which stands for the COVID-19 Outbreak Public Evaluation Initiative, which again was to really try to understand the public sentiment about the pandemic, the mitigation efforts and then and then also to understand mental and behavioral health during the pandemic with so many kind of abrupt profound changes to the way that we were leading our lives. And one of the things you found was the effect of the pandemic on young adults, which is why we wanted to talk to you today. And we're going to get to that in a minute, but we want to let our listeners know this is a two-part podcast. The first part we're going to talk about the young adults and the pandemic. And Ellen, why don't you tell everyone what we're going to talk about in the second part? Okay, the second part is something that I bet almost every single person listening struggles with, and that is sleep. As we looked into Mark's background, we learned that in addition to all these accomplishments that he just spoke about, that he was a graduate student researching at the School of Psychological Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine at, Mon is it Monash University? Uh, oh, Monash, it? yeah. Monash, Okay and an honorary research fellow at the Institute for Breathing and Sleep at Austin Health. And he's also a member of the Lichtman Lab at the Harvard Brain Science Initiative and is studying sleep physiology. And I have to mention too, the apple does not fall far from the tree. His dad, Charles Seisler, is a professor of sleep medicine at Harvard Medical School and the chief of the Division of Sleep and Circadian Disorders in the departments of medicine and neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. So this is a, a family that is immersed in sleep. And I'm really curious at some point, I want you to actually confess to us if your family does sleep better than every <laughs> Absolutely, <other one>. absolutely. <laughs> and, and I can tell you too, when we get on a sleep topic that Denise was very invested in sleep in her children. <laughs> Forgot about that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, anyway, so we're really happy to be talking about that too. But I will bounce it back to COVID first, Denise, right? Right, right. And so remember, Mark, we're talking to parents of young adults and they're interested in your study. But what they really want to know is what things they might not know about what their young adult children might be facing. Tell us a bit about your findings, how in regard to anxiety and depression, I guess, in young adults. Yeah. And so and I'm grateful, you know, again, to, to be able to speak about this because it's such an important uh, element of the pandemic separate from kind of the 
everything else that we've been living. So in this study, which was uh, administered in June of 2020, so just a couple of months into the pandemic, we found that three in four young adults, so the adults aged between 18 and 24 years, kind of that college or just post-college age, uh, three in four of them reported having experienced uh, one or more adverse mental or behavioral health symptoms. And that would include symptoms of anxiety, depression, trauma related to the pandemic and, and the circumstances surrounding that, as well as uh, substance use to cope with pandemic-related stress or emotions. And then lastly, having seriously considered suicide in the, in the past 30 days. And that number, uh, that 75% of young adults is much higher than any of the other age groups, which it, there was a decreasing trend with age. So kind of the older adults had the lowest levels uh, of adverse mental health symptoms. And that is something that had been observed b- before the pandemic, but to a lesser degree. So kind of the disparity in the prevalence of adverse mental health symptoms was not uh, as as wide as it kind of has been observed during the pandemic. And that is within the context of the overall prevalence of adverse mental health symptoms tripling in the early stages of the pandemic. And if you had to guess, I mean, I guess I would just based on my own life, and I'm not a young adult, I'm an old adult. Would you guess that this is increased? Because not much has changed. I mean, some have gone back to class in person, but it seems to me right now, or at least over this summer, COVID was has really been spiking. Yeah, um, it's it's a good question, and I think that a lot of that would probably depend on kind of the different trajectories that have been observed. So over time, and this this isn't something that we've looked at yet. We're excited to kind of look at that as the project has continued, but over time researchers have identified that there are different subsets of each of these age groups where some younger adults have had persistently very high levels of adverse mental health symptoms. So kind of started off right at the onset of the pandemic and maybe even preceding it, maybe weren't doing as well and then have continued in that in that group. There's also a group that started off in those initial weeks maybe had high levels of anxiety and depression symptoms. And then over time, those have been alleviated for one reason or another. Maybe it's a little bit more socialization or uh, less uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. Of course, it's going to continue, but maybe it's affecting their day-to-day lives or, or careers less. And then there are groups on the flip side that have either kind of had persistently low levels of anxiety and depression and other adverse mental health symptoms over time. And then groups that have steadily increased. And one of the questions is, at what point is it the pandemic versus kind of the collective traumas that we've all been experiencing uh, in the world with wars and uh, race relations, uh, a lot of tensions boiling over? Yeah, it's just a, a time when a lot is going on and, and then the social media reaction and, and all of that kind of perpetuates uh, the traumatic experiences that many of us have either directly or indirectly shared experience. I think that's a really good point. And I really wonder yeah. sometimes, because I think about this all the time. I mean, I'm older, I've pretty much lived my life, but I think of myself as a young person surrounded with war, the pandemic, the race relations, social media, media, it all seems to like be coming together as a, um, what would you call it when things all come together as a, I'm losing the word, Ellen, Mark, come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a crisis point? Well, crisis point, but a crescendo, you know what I mean? It's like right. all coming together is this crescendo and it must be hard to figure out what's what. I do think, and again, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, that COVID will remain kind of the overlying negative over all of it. You know what I mean? The war is horrible. The race relations are horrible. But there's always this, I think all of us have changed considerably since COVID. Yeah. I know I'm less social. I don't want to go out as much. I don't know how you find that in any of your research in all the different age groups. Yeah. And and one of the 
questions. So, I mean, first of all, to your point, when, when all of this is happening so quickly and it's one after the other, and then the pandemic, in contrast to some incident traumatic experiences that happen like a hurricane or uh, a terrorist attack, for example, 9-11, that happens. And then there's some time to recover after it. Whereas the pandemic has has been overlaid over all of these experiences and it's always in the background, right? We're, right. That's sort of what I was trying to say, right? And, and we have reminders all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think that part of what that does is it limits our ability to process the different emotions that we've been experiencing during this time. Because yeah, again, it's one thing to the next, to the next. And regardless of what age group you're in, it's it's difficult to find the time to really decompress and, and start to understand and process the emotion. It's almost like it's continuing. So you never get to process and deal with it. Yeah. I mean, for an example, I think, I mean, I'm double boosted. I'm, you know, everything. I'm supposed to go to a very special event for my daughter next weekend. I'm supposed to go to two other graduations before it. I'm, I'm very concerned about going to anything else because I won't make it to that because even though the symptoms are not so bad, you still can't do things when you've tested positive. You can't right. move forward. You don't feel comfortable ever planning and completely moving forward with your life because you don't know. Right. And, and so there's yeah. been this phenomenon of people being having a sense of relief when they test positive initially because <laughs> you know then you have your two week interval and then some level of immunity of course it doesn't last it doesn't last for too long right, uh, right. and people probably over you know over rely on that mm-hmm. uh, post infection immunity mm-hmm. but yeah it's this strange phenomenon for sure and and uh, I think to the points that we've been talking about uh, in terms of emotional processing, I think that also speaks a little bit to the difference in the response to the pandemic by age, because research before the pandemic had shown that uh, older adults, and, and there are different reasons behind this, some you know changes in the development of the brain over time, uh, a collection of experiences that people have had and, and processed but older adults generally have demonstrated better ability to manage emotions with age. So over time, both within individuals and then greater day-to-day emotional stability and the ability to uh, tolerate uncertainty and kind of the unknowingness of, of what's going on. Some of that has to do with, well, as a young adult, we start to call into question is this normal, right? This kind of, because we haven't lived independently and experienced anything other than this. Uh, In in my case, for example, having had this transition, like I had just moved to Australia and I was so ready to do all those things that young adults do and rent and yeah, start (laughs) to try to grocery shop and all that. And then all of a sudden I'm back living with my parents. And And I think a lot of people experienced something similar to that at some level. And then even in the return to semi-normalcy, there's a question about, well, is it normal for there to just be so much going on all the time? Yeah, that's so good. Is is yeah. there a normal? And I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm not sure there is. That's how I feel. I, I want you to no. address also the difference you found in socioeconomic, levels of socioeconomic. You found that I think it was the lower the socioeconomic status, the the less resilient. Was that what you found? Yeah. And that captures probably a combination of factors. There has the there's a group at the BU School of Public Health that has done a lot of research into the role of socioeconomic status in mental health. And, and some of that has to do perhaps even more than income with assets. So things that might be generational or like bank account savings that people can rely on as a fallback in response to acute changes in if someone is furloughed or something like that. There's a sense of security and yeah, having to worry less about or potentially having to worry less about these acute changes. If you know that even if you lose a job, you'll have time to search for a new one before there's um, really, a, yeah, a major challenges. And so they they found, they had an elegant study demonstrating kind of the relationship of 
assets in general, whether those be economic or social, like being in, having social capital, uh, et cetera, w- w- those were all associated with kind of b- more improvement in mental health during the pandemic after that initial stressor. That makes perfect sense. I'm sorry, Ellen, I'm talking too much. Can I ask one no, more question here? Please do. I'm listening intently. And <laughs> I, I feel I, I feel really badly. I want to wrap this up, but there's two things I think we really have to um, talk about. One, and I know you're a young adult yourself, but I think that as parents of young adults, what kinds of things can we look at? You know, because sometimes we, you know, we're at an age where a lot of us are retiring or we're changing our work schedules. We have some of our own worries or we're ready to enjoy our lives and we don't pay attention to the fact that, gee, our kids might really be struggling with this, number one. Number two, it seems that your study brought a lot of caused quite a stir in the media calling for the government to sort of address some of this and bring some organizational resilience for some of these young adults and these groups that have suffered the most. So can you address both of those sort of how us as parents, what do we need to pay attention to? And what other things do you think your study has help companies, individuals, you know, organizational resilience kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Those are Two really excellent questions. For the first one, part of the challenge is that at least in the initial onset of the pandemic kind of time, there were a lot of changes in behavior and appearance and mood that uh, might have reflected acute adverse mental health symptoms. And, and those are can be sometimes warning signs if they are prolonged for something you know, if they persist for weeks or months, that something potentially more serious is is going on. So those would be changes in behaviors, like either no longer participating in activities that um, you know the your kids might have once enjoyed, uh, or having less joy while completing them, communicating less than usual, sleeping and eating differently, whether that be. And and what's interesting is that can either look like not eating or sleeping, or it can look like eating or sleeping more than usual. And Mm -hmm. then changes in appearance where it might be neglecting hygiene, basic care, taking fewer showers or, or baths, and then changes in mood, which is somewhat expected, but that might come off as sad or irritated, angry, aggressive. And I think in those situations, it's really important as caregiver or to try to be supportive to separate those emotions from the individual and and recognize that in some ways that could be a projection or externalizing something that that individual doesn't want to be feeling that way. I, I don't know. I, I've had experiences where I treat someone a certain way and then I'm upset with myself because I didn't want to portray that emotion that I was uh, internalizing and then externalizing and putting on someone else. So then being on the other side of it, recognizing that, and then, yeah, kind of giving yourself grace and recognizing that your kid didn't really want to do that and um, that they might need help. Those are great. Those are really, really good things. And I think even thinking about when you talked about going to Australia and then you had to pack up and get home, Um, The one thing I've seen a little bit among young adults is sort of a giving up kind of thing that they had all these plans. It's not going to happen. So Starbucks is just fine for me. And not that Starbucks isn't a fabulous career. I don't mean to, but maybe they had a dream of being a nurse or being a, you know, whatever it might be, but they just don't. There's a Greek word called orexy, appetite to do that anymore, because COVID's kind of been this banner of, uh, you know, bad luck kind of thing. Right, right. And then, yeah, to your, can I speak to the second question? Yes, I want to make sure we get to that. Absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. So I think that we definitely had a call. And in addition to our paper that, you know, I think collectively the media, other researchers, public health officials and agents, and really the entire global community has normalized and started to increase conversations about mental health. And there has been an encouraging response you know, we always want to see more, but at least in in the United States, there was a presidential executive order on uh, saving lives that was signed in late 2020 that allocated $425 million to uh, help to enhance 
care providers and behavioral health training to provide acute support during the during the pandemic. And then so that's kind of at the at the national level. And then at the workplace and occupational health level, there, there have started to be some really exciting initiatives like incorporating mental health care into workplace benefits, having employee assistant programs and workplace uh, health promotion programs that really are oriented around uh, including mental health as part of health and as part of wellness. Uh, and as we transition from treating mental health emergencies as kind of like the point of care to, I mean, obviously that needs to be retained, uh, but then also thinking about mental health promotion. And even for someone who isn't struggling, trying to promote mental health and wellness and optimize it and build healthy behaviors so that in the face of adversity, uh, people are more resilient. Uh, that That's something that I think is going to be really valuable and, and we're starting to see a little bit more of. One example of that would be a method of programs for something like therapy or an equivalent that is opt out. So rather than having it something that's available to oh. people at the company mm-hmm. where you know you have to go search it out and then enroll and go through that whole process, which is a major barrier. I mean, it takes time. Huge. It might take money. Either way, it's not something that everyone in the company is doing. So you feel like I need this, you know, like to get to the point where you're going to sign up for that. I think that sounds fabulous. Yeah. I, yeah don't you? I mean, Amazing. I think that a lot of people don't sign out up also because there's still a stigma to mental health, but if it's right. kind of, you're already in it, it's easier not to, you know, to stay rather than saying I need the help because of the stigma. That's I, yeah. I yeah. really hope that happens, Mark. I hope that happens. You and me both. <laughs> All right. Any two, before we get to sleep, any two parting pieces of advice on this topic, and then we'll move on to sleep. Yeah. Um, two pieces of advice would just be to check in early and often uh, with friends, family, you know, your kids and, and just have, conversations about what is working and what isn't working but to and and that's kind of for everyone and then I think for people who have children who are struggling recognizing that first of all you're far from alone it's a very common experience that's shared by a lot of people and, and recognizing that is important and then the other element is that when someone is in that position and you're caring for them, they're telling your kids what to do and trying to offer solutions and solve things can be valuable after there's been some sort of established relationship that you're working together towards something. But in the absence of that, it it can be unproductive and if anything, push them away. So Empathy before advice proposing solutions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. I think it's something that a lot of people uh, value. Right. I think that yeah. is terrific. And you know, Mark, I just want to add just, I think sometimes when empathy can really just take the form when parents are afraid to bring these topics up to their child is to say, I've noticed you've been behaving in this way. I've noticed that when I call, you don't pick up the phone. I've noticed that you are not going out. Like that's a, that's a way of, of sort of starting the conversation in a way that's hopefully not judgmental because that's also, you know, I'm, I'm concerned because, you know, help me understand what's going on for you can be a way into it. I think for some parents who have trouble, you know, they're frustrated themselves, like you said. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk about sleep. Because I was up at 3.30. <laughs> All right, Ellen, I'm going to let you take the lead on sleep here because I've talked too much, okay? <laughs> can I so can I start by... Surprise, everyone. We're not going to let you listen to the sleep episode with Mark. Not now, at least. It's so great, we've decided to wait and share this as our first episode when we return in September. So sorry. Ellen and I were just a bit stunned by his knowledge and advice. It's just things we haven't read before. We'll put some of them into practice over the summer, and we'll let you know how it turns out. So thank you, Mark, for all the scoop on COVID and our young adult children. It makes so much sense that this heavy cloud continues to hang over all of us with no relief. All of us feel the strain. 
I really hope that businesses begin to provide mental health care that is opt out rather than opt in. What a great idea and what a difference that would make. Thanks to all of our listeners for your continued support. Thanks to Connie Gort Fisher, our audio engineer. Please visit our website, www.biteyourtonguepodcast.com. You can find ways to support us right there. Have a wonderful summer, listeners. Tune in for some of our favorite episodes over the last few seasons. And remember, sometimes you may just have to bite your tongue.